Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the opportunity to open up the Word of God and to come together as a church family to, um, to study the Word and to worship you with our minds as we consider your truth. And so I pray for, um, God, your Spirit to open up our ears, to open up our hearts to receive everything that you have for us here this morning, God, that we would walk away filled with joy, that we would walk away filled with correction if needed, that we would walk away knowing that we are loved by you. And so, God, would you do that this morning in our hearts and in our lives? In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. So let's open up our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John in chapter number 21. Chapter number 21, and we're going to be starting at verse number 15. So you guys ever watch TV shows where houses are being restored? HGTV, any HGTV fans up in this place, right? Yes. Okay, flip or flop, fixer upper, you know, um, what's that guy, Chip, Chip Gaines? He's crazy. Right? Anyways, I just like watching these shows and really you get to see, my wife got me into them, but you really see these houses, you know, being re- fully restored and, and completed. And man, it's like how they take that and make something like this. And, and it's just so beautiful. I also like to watch the shows where they have, you know, the, the, they get the 1955 Chevy Bel Air that's, you know, a bucket of rust, you know, and then they, they transform it and they restore it back to its original. I'm like, oh man, I like those shows as well. Well, hey, listen, you know, sometimes you might see these houses or even the cars or whatever, and you think like, well, hey, there's not much to be done to them because it looks in pretty much in good shape when you don't realize that, you know, uh, when they start doing this restoration project, you know, it's like one thing that leads after another. They knock down a wall and they're like, oh, hey, uh, time out. We got some plumbing issues. Or they pull up the floorboards and they're like, oh, man, wait a minute. There's some cracked foundation that's going on here, you know. And then you realize, like, oh, wow, a full restoration project is needed. Like, that's not just going to be welcomed, you know, and like, oh, cool, we're going to get a fresh new house. But it's absolutely needed for that house, right? Now, let me tell you something, guys. Listen to this. We all love restoration shows or cars that are restored or houses that are restored. But you know what God loves more? He loves a restored life. God is into restoring lives, restoring marriages, restoring the soul of an individual. Amen? That is what he is into, and he's interested in that because to him, a soul, a heart, a life is more precious than a car or even that of a home. And as we go, even as believers, as a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can go through life where there's, there's damages and there's things that go on in our life that, well, it needs to be addressed before the Lord. God needs to, to fix it, and only God can fix it. There are some things in life that we try to fix all on our own. And maybe you're here today and you're like, you've been trying to fix things all on your own. I want you to know, stop trying to fix it on your own. Surrender it to the Lord. He can fix it. He can restore you, amen? That's what it's all about. And as we go through life, guys, even as believers, one of the things that's really easy for us to do, what's tempting for us to do, is to sweep that issue under the rug. You know, it's like, oh, you know what? Well, let's not just pay attention to it. Let me, let me sweep it under the rug. Or, you know, let me just put another coat of paint on it. And, you know, it's going to look okay. And again, maybe on the surface, it may look okay. But down deep, when you pull those things back, it's not okay. It's actually destroying your life. You know, and again, the easy thing to do is to hide it. Well, listen, the heart of God is that we would follow him. The heart of God, friends, is that you and I would follow Jesus without any barriers because these things that we tend to want to sweep under the rug or not have God fix it or, or you know, uh, um, restore us, they end up being just a barrier to us, a barrier between you and God. Thus, your life is no longer being lived out in a fruitful way. 
You know, you're not being blessed the way that you would probably would like to be blessed as you watch and see other people's lives. And you're like, man, you sense that there's a genuine joy in their life. And you're like, how come I don't have that? Perhaps maybe there's some things that God wants to restore in your life. God wants to fix in your life. But you have to let him do it because we have a tendency of wanting to do it all on our own. And these things, they just become a barrier. God wants us to follow him with no barriers in life. And there's too many people, friends. Listen, there's too many people that come to church and like on Sunday mornings, on Tuesdays, or, you know, they, they come to church, they're believers, they believe in God, but they just want to sweep the issue under the rug rather than to let Jesus restore them, rather than to let Jesus do it and to fix it. And friends, let me tell you something. When Jesus restores a life, the natural response is to follow Jesus closely. And when we follow Jesus, that's the natural response when Jesus restores us. And when we do that, what ends up happening is that the results come out. And the results is a fruitful life being lived out before the Lord. You know, a fruitful life with joy and, and with peace in your heart, knowing that, you know what, God is doing something in my life. And this is something that I want to talk about here this morning. In John chapter number 21, verses 15 through 19. Now, you guys remember, this is the third time we're, we're told that Jesus um, presents himself to the disciples. Last week, as we were looking at it, the disciples, they kind of went back to what they were doing right? And they began to go and fishing and all night long they were fishing on those dark waters, just drifting away, not catching anything until they began to listen, until they listened to God. And Jesus was there on the shore, right? They're giving them instruction and they were obedient to that instruction that Jesus gave. Thus, the results were they cast their net in that morning on the other side of the boat and they lifted a net full of fish, Okay, and some of the things that we looked at was that maybe that's what God is doing in our life because Jesus is on the shore of our life desiring to give us instruction. And I pray that we would all, that you would listen to the instruction of God. And so this is the scene here. And Jesus has made breakfast for them, some fish tacos for breakfast. And so here... This area of the beach, remember, they're on the Sea of Galilee, and this area of the beach and the fire that is there may bring back a lot of memories for people we're going to be looking at here this morning, guys, is on Peter, Jesus and Peter. Now, the other apostles and disciples, they're there, but the focus is really solely on Peter. And I love this because Jesus likes to focus on us individually, right? And so... Peter may have perhaps been thinking of and re remembering back in uh, when Jesus first called him. And Mark chapter number one and verse number 16, as, the, as uh, Peter and his brothers were out there, they were fishing, and Jesus gets there on the scene and he says, hey, you guys follow me and I will make you be to become fishers of men, right? And so that's the same stretch of beach we believe. And also there's a fire that's going on right there. Because Jesus, we're told that there's a coal, a fire, and he's making the fish. And maybe, we're not told this in the scripture, but, you know, in my mind's eye, I'm kind of just, you know, reading this narrative, and I was like, maybe Jesus is like, hey, Peter, you know, I'm kind of cold. Do you want to come get warm by the fire? Did that bring back a memory for Peter? Oh, maybe it did. And so there's like some memories being stirred, and perhaps in, in, uh, in the life of Peter, you know, and what I, and I, the reason why I was thinking of this, guys, and I want to mention this, is because God oftentimes brings to surface issues. He brings to surface issues or failures or the things that we've swept under the rug that we hope that will just go away, right? He brings them back to our memories so that we would deal with it. Or better yet, he brings them back to our memories or he brings them back to the, up to the surface so that we would let him deal with it. There's probably a lot of things maybe that, that God has in our lives and your lives today that God wants to deal with them, with it today, with you today. And so God does these things, you guys. He does these things with the, with the things that are unconfessed, you know, in our lives. And the reason why God does this, friends, listen, it is for good reason. 
God doesn't just go around looking to make us and make you feel horrible, okay? Sometimes people feel that. Like, oh man, every time I go to church or, you know, it's just like, I feel like, you know, God is there and he just makes, God makes me feel horrible. No, God brings to surface issues in our life for good reason. And that reason is, is that we would confess and repent of it. That you would confess and repent of it because Jesus knows that these things, they act as a barrier to us. And God doesn't want any barrier he doesn't want these barriers. That's why the whole purpose of why Jesus came to this world, to, to knock down those barriers, the barrier of sin, so that we would have this relationship and follow closely the word of God and the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? So let me re read right here, chapter number 21, starting at verse number 15. This is what it says. It says this. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, watch this. He says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him again, a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. We'll stop right there for right now. So notice that before Jesus here, before Jesus begins to even take care or minister to the spiritual need that Peter has, he takes care of the physical need. He makes sure that, hey, Peter's got something to eat, that he's comfortable. And I love this, you guys, because this really goes to show us that Jesus, he cares. He cares about every aspect of our life, not just the spiritual aspect. That is number one. The number one thing that Jesus is always concerned with is your, our spiritual need. But he's also concerned about the physical need. I always think of there in the Gospel of Mark, there in chapter number five, I believe it is, or maybe chapter number two, with the paralytic man. Remember, and the paralytic man is, is um, you know, he's uh, um, let down from the roof, and then all of a sudden, Jesus goes to him, and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he, because the Pharisees were there, and there was, they were questioning, uh, Jesus goes over to the, this paralytic man, and he also says, take up your bed and walk. He heals him of his physical condition. Jesus is concerned about our spiritual and our physical condition, and we see that even here. Here with Peter. Right now, Jesus, the reason why now Jesus is kind of isolating Peter is because he's got a plan for Peter. A plan for Peter to follow him and that a plan for Peter to be fruitful. But before this plan for Peter can begin for Peter to follow closely and to be fruitful. As a matter of fact, we know in the book of Acts, Peter is a pillar. He is a leader in the early church. Before that can even happen, there's some things that Jesus needs to deal with in Peter's life. There's some areas in Peter's life where he needs to be restored back into this position, back into this a fellowship, right? He needs to deal with his failures. So do you guys remember when Jesus told Peter, he says to Peter, Peter, before the rooster crows, you are going to deny me three times. And remember Peter's response? He was like, oh, no way, Lord. I'm not going to uh, deny you. These knuckleheads might, but I love you more than these guys. I will never deny you till the wheels fall off, Lord. Remember? And, and then Jesus is like, okay, yeah, we'll see. And what goes to happen as Jesus is arrested? You know, three times Peter has an opportunity, you know, to, to confess Jesus. But these three times he fails and he denies Jesus. And then he hears that rooster crow. And so this is the failure that Jesus is dealing with. And so the same thing may need to take place today in our hearts. Because there's probably perhaps areas in our lives where you've, you know, you know that you've failed God. You know there's some mistakes. You know there's some challenges or circumstances in your life that you're not allowing God to deal with. 
Maybe you've been trying to sweep it under the rug or, or just, you know, put another coat of paint, you know, just to hide that mold right there, you know? That mold don't go away, you know? It's there in the shower and he's like, you just move the shampoo bottle there now, try to hide it. I don't want to see that no more, you know? You can't hide it. It's going to grow. We need, it needs to be dealt with, right? And so Peter's, guys, listen, Peter's failure here was him publicly denying Jesus, and now he's publicly being restored here. Now, there's some things in life where, you know, some public failures, you know, public sin, yes, that does, it needs to be dealt with publicly. But there's also some private things that, you know, that needs to be dealt with privately between you and the Lord. And where you have someone that you care, that you know that cares about you and, and cares about your spiritual walk to keep you accountable and to love you enough to pray with you and to guide you and to lead you. And you need to submit to that kind of leadership in, in the church. So three times Peter denied him and three times Jesus, we see Jesus here questions the love of Peter. And notice Jesus says, hey, Peter, do you love me more than these? Now, guys, listen, I kind of think of what was Peter's emotion like right now? You know, what was he like? You know, was he thinking, oh, man, you know what? Things are good, you know? Jesus just made us some breakfast. It's all good, you know? We just got a, 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 a net full of fish. And maybe Peter's thinking, oh, maybe Jesus forgot about it, you know? And he's cool with us now. You know, hey, so he's grubbing on these things. And all of a sudden, in the midst of the conversations that were going on during the time of the breakfast, Jesus is like, hey, Peter. And Peter's like, what's up, Jesus? Do you love me more than these? And Peter's like, well, well yeah, of course. He asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? And that third time, Jesus is like, hey, Peter, do you love me? And he's noticed, he says, do you love me more than these? Maybe, again, going back to Jesus, reminding Peter, remember that time you said you love me more than everybody else? Well, do you? And so Peter's here is like, yes. The third time Jesus asks him, you know, do you love me? We're told there in verse number 17 that he was grieved. And we're going to get to that in here in just a second. But I want you guys to know that there's, there's two different words that are being used here for the word love. And really, for the most part, primarily, there's only two words in the New Testament that we have for love, and that is agape and phileo love. Agape love. How many of you guys have heard that word, agape love? Oh, awesome. Praise God. Well, agape love, agape is a Greek word, and, and that word is to describe an unconditional type of a love. Unconditionally, Jesus loves us. And there's another word here, phileo love. Now, phileo love is, is a, you know, is, is a love of like brotherly love, a fondness, like, oh, I love them. You know, they're my brother. I love this group. You know, there's a fondness there. Now, and then here in the gospel of John, John, the writer who's writing this whole gospel, he uses these words kind of interchangeably. Okay. So there's really, you know, yes, is there, you know, a lit, um, you know, um, uh, you know, a literal difference in the meaning of the word? Yes. But in John's writing, they're pretty synonymous right here. They're pretty much the same, okay? So I don't want us to lose sight on, well, oh, Peter just says, hey, I'm fond of you. He doesn't really love him. No, Peter's saying that he loves him. He loves him, okay? So these are the two different words. And, you know, and so here we see that Jesus is just questioning and bringing Peter to this place, you know, some might people even say that, you know, man, why is Jesus putting him on blast? How many of you like to be put on blast? Raise your hand. See, nobody likes to raise. No, I don't like to be put on blast. You know, man, leave me alone, dude. You know, don't put me on blast. Well, here, this is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is, you know, doing this in a public arena right there with the disciples and the, and the apostles. He's, you know, um, doing this publicly. And the purpose of Peter being confronted like this in this manner is for him to be restored. Guys, sometimes we don't like to be, again, as I said, none of us like to be put on blast. But, you know, there's a reason here. Why is it that we do not, that we do not like to be put on blast? I'll tell you why. It's because we're prideful. It's been, man, don't be focusing on me. Don't be looking at me like this. Why'd you do this? You know, we get all, you know, puffed out. Hey, who do you think you are? You know? But Jesus, 
I want us to remember, remember this verse, you guys. Jesus gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. The Bible tells us Jesus resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. You see, and when Jesus does this, when he pulls back areas of our lives, as he's doing here with Peter, Peter, you said you love me more than anybody else, but let me peel something back here. Let me knock down these barriers. Let me knock down these walls to expose what's really going on. And you see, Jesus, my friends, listen, Jesus does that in our lives through the work and the power of his Holy Spirit and through his word. Jesus pulls back areas of our lives that need to be dealt with. Perhaps there's areas of your life here today that that you know that God wants to peel back. He wants to lift that carpet and you're like, oh no, Lord, keep that carpet down. You know, he wants to lift the floorboards. He wants to pull the paint off, knock down a wall to expose areas in our lives and your lives that needs to change, that needs to be fixed so that you and I would be restored in the same manner. Here we see Peter is being fully restored. Right? So Jesus, again, he's exposing these broken areas in Peter's life. Why is he doing this? Friends, listen, when Jesus does stuff like this in our lives, there is always a purpose. And the purpose is this. These things are a barrier in Peter's life. This failure in Peter's life of denying Jesus is a barrier for Peter to be used fruitfully in his life for the, for, the, for the cause of Christ. See, Peter's, Peter's not ready to be fruit, a fruitful follower until his failures are removed. And that goes the same for you and I today. We are not ready to be a fruitful follower of Jesus Christ until our failures are removed. In other words, until you allow Jesus to get those areas of your lives, whether it's shame, guilt, unconfessed sin, maybe it's a failure of you denying Jesus and not representing Christ correctly in your home or in your marriage. Maybe when you come to church, you can represent Jesus really good, but in the marriage or in the home or with your children or in your workplace, people don't even know you're a Christian because of how you live your life. See, Jesus wants to change that. And the reason is, he wants your life to be fruitful. How many of you want your life to be fruitful? Come on, right? We all want our life to be fruitful. We all want, man, Jesus is doing some crazy radical things in and through my life, and it blows my mind away. And it does, despite our own selves and our own failures and our own faults that we have. Until those things are addressed, we cannot go forward and be fruitful, a fruitful follower. You can still be a Christian. You know, Christians say, well, what if I just believe in Jesus and that he died for me and my sin? You know, will I still get to heaven? Absolutely. The the way that you and I get to heaven is by believing in what Jesus did on the cross. There's nothing more that we have to do but believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. But let me tell you something. If you don't allow God to, to restore those broken areas in your life, your life being lived out will be fruitless. It'll be tough. It'll be hard. It'll be challenging. And you're going to be like, man, why am I still in this place like this? Maybe because you haven't allowed Jesus to restore those areas in our lives. Christians, too many Christians, many believers, they, they go to church go to church and sit into Bible studies and have this automatic expectation that things, I've been going to church, but how come my marriage is not fixed? I've been going to church and, and my kids are still the same way. I've been going to church and I'm, I'm, I still don't have this joy like these other people here. They always come and sing and they seem to be happy and I'm not happy. You know, you know who you are. And the reason why is because many Christians come to church without ever addressing the sin, whatever, without ever addressing the failures or the, any issue, any circumstance of life. In their, they don't allow God to deal with it. And now, as a result of that, it has become a barrier 
It's become a, bar- it's become a barrier. And God wants to knock down those barriers. He loves, God, listen, listen, guys, God loves you. He loves you enough to even know that, hey, this may hurt a little while. This may sting a little bit. You know, if, if a house can talk, now we know a house can't talk. But if a house can talk, right, and they got that, you know, and they know that that guy Chip Gaines is about to go into, you know, into the house and do demo day, right? That house would say, oh, please don't knock down that wall. It's going to hurt. <laughs> None of us like to have our walls knocked down. None of us really like to have our, the floorboards of our own lives pulled up because we know it's going to expose things. Hmm. Before anyone truly follows and serves Jesus fruitfully, this, these things, they need to be addressed. And please, friends, don't think, well, I don't serve God. I just go to church. No, let me tell you something. If you, are, if you say that you love Jesus and you've asked Jesus to forgive you of all of your sins, you are a servant of God. You should see yourself as a servant of God in your home, in your marriage, in your workplace. You should see yourself as such. And God wants you to be a fruitful servant, a fruitful follower of him because God has great and wonderful plans for you in your life. Now notice in verse number 17 right here where it says, John, he he gives us some insight here about Peter's emotion as Jesus is questioning him. John tells us that Peter was grieved because he asked him a third time. He was grieved. He was sad. He was hurt. Lord, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing, you ever have that kind of response to somebody? Why are you doing this? Why are you making me do this? This makes me sad. Peter says, here John says, Peter was grieved. Now, friends, let me tell you something. Now I'll tell you from the, just right here, point blank. The process of restoration isn't always going to be pleasant. The process of restoration, it's not going to be pleasant in our life. No one really likes it. You know, you're exposing areas of my life, Lord. Because the reason why we don't like it, my friends, and I'll tell you, listen, here's the reason why, is because it means that you're now, you, now you have to deal with your failure. Now you have to deal with the guilt. You have to deal with the shame. You have to deal with the circumstances that you kind of just wish would just go away. And now you have to deal with them, right? It's never going to be easy. It's never easy, guys. It's never easy. But let me tell you something. It is necessary. It is extremely necessary. For, for us to be exposed in our hearts, in our lives, and things in our lives to be exposed in this way so that our lives will be completely restored. You know, and when I think of this, just, just uh, this makes me, you know, think of, you know, what it means like to follow the Lord. Look at verses number 18 and 19. It's not always easy. Now, verse 18 says this, most assuredly, Jesus is telling Peter now, most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you were, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you uh, where you do not wish. John, again, gives us some insight of what Jesus is speaking to Peter. Jesus is speaking to Peter prophetically right here. And, he's, and this is the insight that John gives us. He's, he, says, he says these things signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, Jesus then says to Peter, follow me. And again, those words that Jesus had said when he first met Peter, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Now, when I think of this and what Jesus is saying to Peter here, you know, uh, the kind of death that he's going to have to go through, this explains to us, or the thought that I get behind this, is is the cost of discipleship. The cost of discipleship. And Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, in chapter number 9, in verses 24, excuse me, in 23 and 24, uh, Jesus tells the disciples there, you know, to, to deny yourself, right, and to pick up your cross daily and follow after me. And friends, let me tell you something. For us as Christians and for us that may know this verse and that verse, and we, we know that Jesus says for us to pick up our cross and follow after him, you know, okay, cool. We're like, oh, yeah, that's a, what a great verse, you know. It can be even someone's, um, you know, life verse. Let me tell you something, though. 
When Jesus first said this during this time to his disciples, this was a crazy thought because the cross represented death, a death sentence. Anybody, listen, anybody who was observed carrying their cross, the cross beam, anybody who was anybody at the time would know that that person is on his way to death, period. And Jesus is saying, let's pick up our cross. You want to follow me? Pick up your cross and follow me. The idea of Jesus is saying, that's a death sentence. And so Jesus is saying, hey, you have to bear your cross. Die to yourself. And not many of us want to die to ourselves. Again, because while the flesh, we battle with the flesh that we have. Jesus is saying to Peter, and what manner of death? And again, the thought that I have is the cost of discipleship behind that. Peter now, guys, Jesus says, after he tells him this, Peter, or excuse me, Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, now I want you to follow me. Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Three times Peter denied Jesus. Three times Jesus is questioning Peter's love for him. And this is the process of restoration for Peter. And Peter, again, this is being done publicly there and with all the apostles and disciples. Can you imagine the other disciples in the midst of the conversations that were going on during this, you know, Jesus made them breakfast. This was like a men's breakfast right here. The very first men's breakfast. You can write that down. And in the process, in the midst of the conversation that maybe that was going on, all of a sudden it's like, hey, Peter, yeah, do you love me? And then Peter's like, well, yeah, why are you asking me that? You know? And probably all the other disciples, in, and they stop their chatter like, Shh. you know? You ever have those conversations with somebody, all of a sudden you're talking, and then the whole room just gets quiet because you know they're listening? Has that ever happened to anybody? You know what I'm talking about? Maybe that's what's going on right here. Peter is being restored. Peter had, this is Peter being restored right here in these passages. And he is being restored. His restoration now clears the path for Peter now to fruitfully follow God. And Peter, friends, he is not the only one to benefit from this restoration. Notice Jesus is telling him, do you love me? Peter says, yes. Jesus says, feed my lambs. Do you love me? Take care of my sheep. Tend my sheep. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. And so Peter's not the only one to benefit. The whole church is able to benefit now because now Jesus is saying, I want you to, I want you to lead. I want you to shepherd faithfully and I want you to do it under the power, without any barriers, under the power of God's Holy Spirit. You see, and so now the church also benefits. Peter would be, you guys, as I already mentioned, he would be an important leader in the early church here. And now having been restored for Peter in his life, now that he's restored, it removes barriers and allows Peter to fruitfully follow with responsibility and to serve and to shepherd and to lead the church I love this because it removes all those barriers and serving the church and loving the church. You know, I've heard Christians say, oh, I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. I love Jesus, but you know, man, I don't like to go to church. Ain't nothing but hypocrites up in there. So I don't even go to church. I just listen to the radio. Let me tell you something. I'm going to share this, guys, because I believe this to be biblically um, correct. That is a foolish thing to say extremely full. How can you say that you love God, but you hate God's people? You can't do that. How can you say, I love the bridegroom, but I hate the bride? Because we are the bride of Christ. You see? And so here, loving the church is extremely important. A commitment, friends, a commitment to Jesus is also a commitment to the church, the bride of Christ. And I hope and pray that every single one of us understand that. Amen? Jesus' restoration for Peter was because he loves him. It was because he loves him and he's got a plan for his life to be fruitful as he follows Christ. 
Jesus followed Christ so closely that when it came time for Peter to die and what mattered that he was going to die, he, we're, we're told by church tradition that he was led to a cross and said, no, I cannot die on the cross the same way that Jesus died. I need to die upside down. I need to be crucified upside down. That's how closely Peter followed him and his life was fruitful for the cause of Christ and for the body of Christ. But before all of that, before all of that, listen, friends, Peter needed to deal with his failures. He needed to deal with his faults because they were barriers. Hmm. And today, maybe during this time that we've been going through this, I truly believe maybe that God, the Holy Spirit, has been exposing areas in your life, bringing, bringing up your past. Hey, remember that one time you had that you didn't represent God correctly? You didn't represent God good? Maybe God is revealing those areas in your life that you've been trying to sweep under the rug and maybe you think it's you know, long gone that Jesus forgot about it. Let me tell you something. He didn't forget about it. Today's a day that that can be dealt with. Just like a house where the walls are being peeled back, knocked down, and, and floors lifted. And during that process, oftentimes, there's cracks in the foundation. There's exposed wire. Do you know if you have an exposed wire behind the walls, all it takes is one little spark, and your whole house will be destroyed? Maybe there's some exposed wire behind the walls of your heart. And all that, all, it can cause a destru destruction in your life. And you know about it. And maybe that's what God is doing. He's exposing areas in your life where there's like mold and, and just funky stuff. And God is like, hey, today's a day that you, can get, you get to deal with that. Today's a day where you allow God to restore you. And friends, let me tell you something. God doesn't put us on blast. God doesn't want to just restore us to make us feel bad. He wants to bless you. He's got a plan for you, a plan, you know, to, to, to you know, really have the, a hope of life with a future and purpose in your life to be filled with joy, not to have the burdens of darkness and junk and filth behind the walls of our hearts today. You can, let, you can let God minister to you. All the mistakes you've made, I've made mistakes. I know that I haven't represented God well. My failures, your failures, your sin, unconfessed sin, or the issues and circumstances in your life that you've been trying to fix all on your own, you can't do it, only God can. And today's a day where you can allow God to deal with it and restore you so that, you're, there would be, so that there would be no barriers in your life between you and him, so that you would follow God closely. And then as you follow God, your life will be fruitful. Restored to fruitfully follow. That's where God wants us to be today. And always that we would represent him well. Amen? Let me pray. Father, Lord, we're so grateful for your word and we're so grateful for your Holy Spirit and for your grace that you have upon us. And Lord, you don't expose these areas in our lives because you don't like us, because you only want to make us feel bad. Lord, we know that you expose these areas in our lives for the same purpose you did for Peter. It's because he had a plan for him. A plan to fruitfully follow. And God, it's never fun. It's never easy. But it's necessary so that our lives and our marriages and our homes and our workplaces and us as parents for it with our children, it would be fruitful, bringing glory to you. And if you would like that in your life, the fruitfulness, but you know that there's areas in our lives. You know, I'll get to tell you, friends. Today's a day 
that God will do something. And if you know that God wants to do something, I pray that you would allow him. Allow him in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's all stand. Listen, as we're standing and as we're going to have this song, there's stuff. I know there's stuff in my life. And I know that there are barriers. And I don't want them to be barriers no more. Because there's times in my life where I don't represent God well. And you guys might be thinking, well, wait a minute, you're the pastor. I know, pray for me. And there's challenges and there's circumstances that we all go through. And I know that until I let Jesus, until I let Jesus fix it, convict me, until I bring it to him, and allow him to just do his work in my life. There's nothing going to change. And there's times in life where we feel like, you know what, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be put on blast. The pastor's asking me to raise my hand or to come forward. And nah, man, what are people going to think? Let me tell you something. That's pride. And I get it. I'll be the first one to raise my hand and tell you I understand that because I do that. Man, if I just stand, go forward, man, my whole church is going to see me. Where are they going to think about me as a pastor? <laughs> but I need it. As I already told you, my church, I, I confess this to you. And I need your prayers because I don't always represent God well in my home. I have pride and sometimes there's people in my life and I just don't like them. And I was like, ah, I don't like them. I don't like them. Ah, Lord. But that's a, that's a me issue. And I, know, and I know that God is not pleased in it. And I don't like to confess it either. But I know that God wants to do so much more. He wants to do so much more in my life and with my home, with my children. I believe that God wants to do so much more in Hope Alive Church. And I feel like, you know, man, these are barriers, Lord. And I don't want these barriers. I want to confess them. Who cares? I don't care what people think. You know, I care what God thinks. Maybe God is doing something in your life and there's areas in your life It may be secret sin and maybe stuff that you haven't dealt with and it's been years and you've just been swept it under the rug hoping it's going to go, it's not going to go away. Jesus loves you. He wants to use your life to be fruitful. Let him do it today. Let today be that day, amen? Because he's got so much more for us, so much more for you, so much more. As this song is being sung and God is doing something in your life and you know that God is saying, hey, there's some a cracked foundation. There's some walls that need to be torn down. Let him tear them down and you come forward as two or more are singing this song. And when they're done, I'm going to pray. And we're all going to pray as a family, as a church family. Amen. Let's do that.